talk to Mike Florio, Pro Football Talk Live co-host, and his new book, Playmakers, is out. Uh, How the NFL Really Works and Doesn't. It's uh, in bookstores today, can be purchased online, and it's uh, a close look at the past two decades of the NFL. One story at a time, more than 100 stories in there, guaranteed to upset the NFL. And Mike Florio joins us on the program. Good luck with the book there, Mike. (laughs) <laughs> Dan, I hope that you enjoy my final appearance on the program. It's been a fun ride. <laughs> the drone is hovering outside my house as I speak. It's locked and loaded. Have you heard from anybody in the NFL home office about your book? Yes, I have. And it was when we first started trying to get people to buy the book. I was told by someone with a very high level position in the NFL that there is a plan to purchase a a supply of them for dissemination and study in the hopes of, I don't know, improving things or at least understanding what this idiot in West Virginia is saying about them. But apparently there will be a box that is sent to 345 Park Avenue at some point, unless the person was lying to me, which is entirely possible. All right. What did Pittsburgh do yesterday? Hey, well, they, they got a placeholder potentially at quarterback. And the irony in all of this is that five years ago, the Bears signed Mike Glennon in free agency, and we all thought Mike Glennon is going to be their quarterback in 2017. God save the Bears. And then that was just the cover so that they could draft Mitchell Trubisky. Now playing the role of Mike Glennon in Pittsburgh in 2022 potentially is Mitchell Trubisky. Because two years, $14 million for Trubisky, that screams out to me that they've got something else in mind. Surely Trubisky isn't the answer. And maybe they'll go forward with him. If so... It's a great dollar for dollar deal. Sims and I were talking about this earlier. Would you rather pay Trubisky $7 million a year or Kirk Cousins $35 million a year? Is Kirk Cousins five times better than Mitchell Trubisky? No, he's not. So it's a great bargain for the Steelers. But it gives them the ability, if they choose in round one with the 20th overall pick, to take a quarterback if there's a guy there they really like or even trade up. We've seen them trade up for guys like Troy Polamalu and Santonio Holmes and Devin Bush. If there's a guy they really like, they're not going to tell us. They run a tight ship. They keep their cards close to the vest. We didn't know they were on Trubisky. That's just an example of how they do things. So they may not be done. But the good news is, if you're a Steeler fan, you don't have to worry about Mason Rudolph playing quarterback for the team this year. I like the move because it doesn't cost you anything. And maybe if you look at what he's done historically, made the Pro Bowl, made the playoffs a couple of times, his one loss record, I think he's, what, eight or nine games over 500. He can be respectable there, and he can get coached up, unlike Matt Nagy, who didn't like him. You know, he's got a coach that will actually coach him up and maybe make him better there in Pittsburgh. Well, the challenge is always this, Dan. When you have a new coach with a player who doesn't fit your system, do you say, too bad, figure out how to fit my system, or do you adjust your system to fit the player? Nagy never adjusted the system. Mm. He tried to force Trubisky to fit it. And look, they went to the playoffs twice with a great defense and a solid supporting cast, kind of like what he's going to have in Pittsburgh. So if they do have to go forward with Trubisky, they're not going to come out and tell us what they think of this incoming crop of rookie quarterbacks. If they decide Trubisky's the guy, they can be as good as they were last year because Trubisky right now is better than Ben Roethlisberger was last year because Roethlisberger was a shell of the guy he used to be. He couldn't move. He had to get rid of the ball very quickly. Trubisky has athleticism. And and if if you adapt your system to suit his strengths and cover up his weaknesses, he he can win games for you. Yeah, I agree. We normally don't focus on the Jaguars as a positive, but it seemed like they had a pretty good day yesterday. How would you sum up what the Jags did? Well, one way to try to get yourself out of a cycle of dysfunction is to spend your way out of it. And that's what the Jaguars are trying to do. They are using money to buy players, to get people to say, hey, that team really isn't a complete and total mess right now. But when you look at the individual players they got, it's pretty good. Now, they may have had to overspend. See, you want to get to the point where you win the ties, where all things equal, players want to come play for you, and someone else has to outbid you to get that guy. I think the Jaguars right now are in that mode where they have to offer more than others. But when you look at what they've done offensively, they get Brandon Scherf. They add a couple of receivers in Christian Kirk and Zay Jones. They, they have Evan Ingram, 
who I think has more potential than what he's shown with the Giants. It's a one-year deal. It's $9 million. He gets to go back to the market next year and maybe cash in if he has a big year. There's just a quiet confidence that's emanating from these moves, and these guys are choosing to sign on for a team that was a mess last year. I think they recognize there's potential with a Super Bowl winning coach in Doug Peterson, a number one overall pick in Trevor Lawrence. Urban Meyer is gone. I think that that the Jaguars, uh, not that they're going to be a playoff contender right away, but who knows? We wouldn't have said last year the Bengals are going to be a playoff contender if we were talking about it in March. The Jags loading up on defense here. Uh, what do you think of the moves? Or Chargers, well, I, I should say. Well, all the Chargers, I, it's, it's incredible. They, look, they're competing not just with the other teams in the AFC West. They're competing with the other team in their own stadium. The Rams are the defending champions. The banner, and I don't know, is the Rams banner going to be up when the Chargers are playing their home games? Either the banner or hmm. the brackets that the banner hangs on will be there as a reminder to the Chargers that the Rams are the current kings of the NFL. So they get their, their answer to Aaron Donald, although Khalil Mack isn't what Aaron Donald currently is. Once upon a time, they were neck and neck best defensive player in the NFL. They get their Jalen Ramsey and J.C. Jackson. They're doing what they have to do. They get some interior defensive line help. They get Sebastian Joseph Day to change locker rooms in the same stadium. So I, I, they are taking full advantage, Dan, of the fact that this is the last year that they have Justin Herbert on the slotted rookie contract, which allows them to overspend cap dollars in other areas because next year they're going to have to do that contract with Justin Herbert. This year they can go all out to try to become a competitor, a contender, a playoff team, maybe a Super Bowl team right away. The numbers on Aaron Rodgers are out. So you got uh, two years guaranteed. You're talking three years, $150 million. What do you do with uh, Devontae Adams? Well, he says he's not going to play under the franchise tag, but what's he going to do? Is he going to sit out all year? Is he going to say no to $20 million and not sit out? It's $20 million for one year of football. I, I think that you have to try to figure out a way to get him to take a deal that he finds acceptable. And so far, they haven't been able to bridge that gap. But if you have to just wait him out, if you just have to hope he shows up, I don't know why he wouldn't show up at $20 million. That is a lot to leave behind. And a year from now, they could just tag him again. So I, I think that, that, yeah, it's going to be a challenge to sign him to a long-term deal. And one of the problems with the Packers is they don't like to guarantee money beyond the first year of a contract. Well, if you're going to get a guy with the franchise tag whose first year salary is already guaranteed at $20 million, if you're going to get him to sign a long-term deal, you better throw that structure out the window. The Steelers did it last year with T.J. Watt. The Bengals haven't done it yet, and they need to. The Packers are going to need to do it with Devontae Adams. Jordan Love experiment over. Would you trade him? I would probably be inclined to keep him around because his salary is so low. He's a lot cheaper than any backup you're going to find. He knows the system. If Aaron Rodgers gets injured, he can step right in. And you never know what Rodgers is going to do after this year. I, I haven't seen the full details. I want to see all of the nuances of this contract to understand how easy or difficult it will be for Aaron Rodgers to retire after one year. I'm curious, is he making a two-year commitment to the Packers or is it year to year? If it's year to year, I need Jordan Love there in the mm. event that Aaron Rodgers decides to retire after the 2022 season. So I think I hold on to him for now. Uh, and and they've got, you know, they've got some investment in the idea that this guy's going to turn into a player. They traded up in round one to get him. I feel bad for him. He's the only one in this drama in Green Bay I feel bad for because he's the only one that got inv involuntarily sucked into it by getting drafted by the Packers because surely he wouldn't have signed up to be the guy who pisses off Aaron Rodgers and sparks multiple MVP campaigns from one of the best quarterbacks in the history of the game. He's Mike Florio, Pro Football Talk Live co-host, and his new book, Playmakers, is officially out. Tom Brady's dad said that the media sort of forced Tom into retirement here. Wow. Do you take credit does, for that? Any do does, Should does, we take yeah, credit does, for that? Does Tom Brady call his wife the media around the house? I mean, I feel like it was Giselle that was pushing and pushing him to finally walk away. There were shots of her in the suite during that playoff loss to the Rams when they were down 27 to three. And she just seemed like somebody who wasn't all that upset that they were down and kind of happy that this thing's finally going to be over. And she'd mm. been trying for five years to get him to walk away. I, I don't know. I don't understand it. I mean, he started talking about coming back six days after <laughs> he announced his retirement. 
No one pushed him into this. Maybe he needed to say, okay, I retire. And now I'm going to take some time to think about my decision. And then he decides to unretire. But it's nobody's fault but his own. If he wanted to, I mean, it all came out of the blue, Dan. He had said all year long he's playing through 2022. This idea that he may retire was stunning to me. It went against everything he had ever said. He's going to play until he's 45. That's through next year. So that, I don't think anyone was pressuring him or it, it was not a story. It wasn't an issue. It all came from him. So I, I don't I don't buy that at all. And, uh, you know, get ready because Tom Brady's now Brett Favre and it's going to be every year, every year, every year until he finally calls it quits. OK, let's uh, recap the bet. You had a bet with Pauly. Now, I'm going to give you credit. You said Brady was coming back, but you said you said that you would bet a pie to the face that Brady would be the week one starter in San Francisco. I did. Okay. I did. Did you lose the bet? Well, I, I, I've tried to negotiate something with Paulie. I thought he was talking to his lawyers about this. I've been waiting to get the facts from the law offices of whoever he has hired uh, to, to come to a conclusion here, because I think he was adamant on the fact that Brady's not coming back. So Paulie, did, did you win the bet? Uh, I've talked to my people, Dan, and we believe, our camp believes that we won the bet outright okay. using semantics over smarts. Okay. Yes, Seaton. Yeah. If yeah. I could be an impartial observer here, mm -hmm. wouldn't we have to wait until week one to find uh, out who yes. won the bet? Okay. Yes. Thank you, Just Seaton. Just in an in, in, you know, effort of fairness here. I think we have to wait week one to see who's starting. So you, are you Team Florio? Wow. No, I'm Team mm -hmm. Justice. Team Fairness. I'm Team Fairness. Team Fairness. Yes. Uh, this is what it sounded like a couple of weeks ago. I think he's coming back. <laughs> I just think he's trying to find a way out of Tampa. Are you willing to bet on that? How much? Like a pie to the face. Oh, a pie to the face. I mean, pie to the face is nothing. It depends. I mean, unless it's like, you know, an acid pie. No, no, no. <laughs> it's a normal pie. A pie of your choice. Anybody want to take Florio up on a pie to the face? Paulie, Paulie will say that Brady does not, uh, not come back. Just the Niners we're talking, right? Just the Niners. I'll do it. Okay. So week pie to the one, face, Florio. Wait, week one, Niners. If he's on the Niners, right, who takes a pie to the face? Paulie does. Paulie? Paulie does. And if he's not on the Niners, then I take the pie to the face. Yes. Okay. You come on the show, and maybe your wife can administer, or uh, Chris Sims can administer a pie that, to the that's face. That's it. Paulie, that's yeah, a walk-off no. like Larry Bird in the three-point shooting contest. He's a Joe but, Namath, but, Super Bowl three. Seton's right. Seton's right. Week one... Is the trigger here? Paulie did say Until just the Niners. Arrives. Paulie did squeeze in just the Niners. I know. He okay, did. Okay. How about this? The Monday after week one, you'll pay up if Tom I'll Brady is still. I'll pay up. I'll pay up. Okay. If he's, if he's not on the Niners week one, yes. I will pay up then. Okay. Yes, Paul. Dan, as the winner of the bet, I'd like to suggest a, an option for Mike Floyd. Ooh, ooh. Mike, as uh, we've been doing this for a long time with Pies to the Face. I'll prepare this for you as an offer on the table now, or mm. you could take Dan's offer. Mm. You could have someone, anyone you choose, hit you at the pie of your choice in the month of March. Oh, an off-season pie. Off-season pie, which is easy. That's okay. easy living. Okay, okay, okay. Or a lemon meringue pie in September. The heat of West Virginia. <laughs> lemon meringue. Yes, Seaton? He, yes Eden. Um, if I can just say the lemon meringue pie as a pie veteran, yeah, that's the one that I had it on my face for about five minutes while the segment ended and had a sunburn for the next two weeks. It burned the crap out of my skin. <laughs> that's an expert witness there. Oh, the lemon. Oh. So oh. I, I just wanted to throw that wow. in there, Mike. Mike, you so, want an off-season pie, or would you rather roll the dice and we would do that Monday after the uh, first weekend of NFL action? Now, now, now the, so the pie would be completely of my own – recipe my own choosing it can be the i would have to you know, approve the, it i would have to approve it well because the the typical pie to the face is just a bunch of whipped cream in a pie pan we like to throw in strawberries or raspberries or blueberries a crust yeah. in there it has to be a pie that you can eat i'll let it ride and i'll take the sunburn from the lemon okay meringue. lemon meringue pie <laughs> uh by the way deshaun watson is he going to cleveland today to talk no to they're them? gonna they're, they're going to Houston to meet him, but Dan, he's got oh. a busy, you mentioned he's going to be questioned today for the first time ever about these 22 civil lawsuits by Tony Busby, who's going to be very aggressive. And I, as a lawyer, former lawyer, recovering lawyer, escaped lawyer, I'm not comfortable with the idea that last night 
Deshaun Watson's meeting with the Saints and Panthers. I want him relaxing. I want him getting a good night's sleep. He's in for a tough day today of being interrogated for hours about what he did and didn't do with these people who have sued him for sexual misconduct. But I don't want him distracted by his next football team. But does he have to answer the questions? Can he plead the fifth in a civil lawsuit or deposition? He was cleared on Friday, no criminal charges. And his lawyer has said, once we get past the grand jury, if he's not charged, he will answer the question. So he's going to answer the question. It's going to be a long day. And Is there and video of this, Mike, that... Are they going to be video? There'll be video. There'll be a transcript. Now, it may not be publicly available, but if I'm interested in Deshaun Watson, I'm talking to his lawyers now saying, look, I want to see this transcript. I want to watch this video before I make a final decision. And I know of at least one potentially interested team that won't do anything until it knows how today goes. So I'm not real comfortable with him being distracted by this, but the Browns are in. I don't know how Baker Mayfield is going to feel about it, but the Browns are definitely in. And we don't even know what the commissioner is going to do. They they might look at this as time served by him not playing last year, but I don't I don't know if the commissioner is going to factor that in in uh, his pun- potential punishment. Here's what I think the NFL has learned over the years, as chronicled by several of the essays in Playmakers. The NFL has learned to never do anything <laughs> until it has to. Right? Yeah. You can't make a mistake if you don't do anything. So there's a chance that they won't do anything until the civil cases are resolved. If he settles them, maybe he gets suspended. If he loses at trial on one or more of these claims, maybe he gets suspended. But Dan, if he fights them all the way through to a verdict and he wins all 22 of these, if 22 boxes are checked in his favor on the verdict form, how do you, how do you suspend him then? How do you justify it? He was never charged. He was never arrested. He was never even found responsible under the very low standard of preponderance of the evidence, 51-49, actually 50.1, 49.9. It's just a little bit. No, he's not responsible. So, so why would you suspend him? So the league has learned to wait. It won't surprise me if the league does nothing at all until after the civil cases are gone. But let's say he writes a check and it all goes away. Then the commissioner won't punish him? Could, could. Now, there was some belief last year because the Dolphins were willing to trade for him. The Dolphins and the Panthers were willing to trade for him before the trade deadline. The Panthers were fine with none of the legal issues being resolved, criminal or civil. We'll take him, but he wouldn't waive the no trade clause for Carolina last year. He would waive it for Miami. Miami owner Stephen Ross wanted all 22 cases settled. My understanding is that the Dolphins believed that he was going to get suspended roughly six games if he had settled those cases. Mm -hmm. So that's what Miami believed. Now the NFL keeps the cards close to the vest. I don't know if they just made a guess, but I think if he settles, he's far more susceptible. I just don't know how you justify suspending him. If he does fight this all the way and a jury decides he didn't do anything that rises to the level of violating someone else's rights. Thank you, buddy. Good luck with the book. He's Mike Florio, pro football talk live co-host. And the new book is called playmakers. Thank you, Mike. Thanks, Dan. Appreciate you. Play of the day up next and your phone calls.